So what do you want? Hine Mato? Wait, what melody do you want people to sing? Behold how good and pleasant it is for people to dwell together. Hi everybody, I'm Barack Herman. My name is Takuchi. Hello everybody, this is Artie Allen. I'm Erica Danziger. I'm Judy Davidson Nahari. Hi, I'm Renee Carroll. Hi, my name is Mark Sokol. My name is Esther Arbid. I'm Ella. My name is Martin Englisher. I am Debbie Moline. My name is Betsy Lynch. Hello, my name is Miriam Chilton. My name is Tom Purcell. I'm Luba Palant. I'm Stacey Belzer. I'm Josh Bender. Norman Mandel. My name is Daniel Christmas. I am Matt Martin. My name is Diana Schnabel. I am Juliana Kalish. Hi, I'm Julie Holbroy. I am Alan Sadloff. Joe Campadonico. Karen Setsumal. My name is Ardell Noah. Joan Rubinenko. Clarine Tamani. I'm Leslie Fleischman. I'm Clara Silver. I'm I'm Elaine Reifman. I'm Michelle Rosinga. Amanda Herring. Jesse Malkin. Christian Katz. I'm Rachel Stein. Phyllis School. Lisa Yaskowitz. Mindy Van Fleet. Nicole Hakimi. Lauren Efron. Stuart Rainer. Rachel Ruth. Ronna Shore. Joel Tarnick. Barb Bell. Maya Tweet. Aaron Atlas. Natalie Lucent. Kevin Cunningham. Chash Ganazi. Amy Katz. Kim Subrin. Buddy Voigt. Jim Slider. Dan Cardona. Paul Frischman. Ruth Peterson Short. Virginia Beach, Virginia. From the JCC of Northern New Jersey in uh, Toronto, Ontario. Malibu, California. The Jewish Community Center of the Lehigh Valley in Valentine. The Jewish Community Center of Greater Kansas City. The Miami Beach JCC. At the Kaiserman JCC in Philadelphia. In Brooklyn, New York. In Washington, DC. In Cleveland, Ohio. Newport News, Virginia. The Calgary JCC located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. In Berkeley, California. In West Hartford, Connecticut. Los Seattle's California. For the Aaron Family Jewish Community Center of Dallas. At Marison JCC in Cincinnati. At the Poses JCC of Northern Virginia. At the Kaplan JCC on the Palisades. Bender JCC in Rockville, Maryland. And Martin Luther Jewish Community Center in Scottsdale, Arizona. In West Nyack, New York. In Scranton, Pennsylvania. Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. JCC of Greater Ann Arbor, Michigan. Greater Houston. Greater Albuquerque. Greater Boston. The JCC of Metro Detroit. At the New Orleans JCC. From coast to coast and everywhere in between, many places, many traditions, one JCC movement. Welcome to ProCon 2021. Welcome to JCC's of North America Professional Conference 2021 and to the promise of community. To open our conference and today's JCC Movement Moment, please give a big round of virtual muted applause for Daron Krakow, President and CEO of JCC Association of North America. Hine matov umanayim, shevet achim gam yachad. How good and pleasant it is that people dwell together. I'm Daron Krakow, President and CEO of JCC Association of North America, and I have the great privilege of welcoming you today to ProCon 2021, the largest gathering of JCC professionals in the history of our movement. Over three remarkable days, roughly 3,000 of us, representing more than 150 JCCs, will convene and confer discuss and debate, reflect and resolve around matters of Jewish community 
and the unique importance and potential impact of our movement. More than 3,000. Just to put that in perspective, more of us will take part in this conference than work in all of the university Hillels on this continent or at the North American Jewish Federations. Our movement is the largest employer in the North American Jewish community. And we gather together as both individuals and as members of a team, as local delegations and as a continental network to celebrate the promise of community. Two years ago, when hundreds of us came to Orlando for ProCon 2019, it was impossible to imagine that within a year, the world would shift on its axis. COVID-19 hit us like an avalanche, upending nearly everything about our lives and work. Concerns for the health and safety of family and friends were coupled with closed facilities and suspended programs. A movement which had long prided itself on its self-sufficiency, generating 80% of our operating budgets from the tuitions and fees paid by our members and participants, was virtually stopped in its tracks. Enormous financial pressures, both within and beyond our movement, left thousands out of work. It was as if we'd been plunged into total darkness, unable to move until our eyes began to adjust and we gradually came to understand our new surroundings. While the nature of the work would change, its essential purpose remained the same, to provide service and support, programs and engagement, and a sense of community to those who seek us out, and in the face of a crisis, to as many more as we could reach. We quickly recognized that in crisis there is also opportunity and in a powerful and inspiring demonstration of our resilience and determination, we adapted. We made our facilities available for food drives and blood drives as testing sites and later as vaccination centers. We aligned with public health authorities to develop guidelines that would enable us to reopen our doors and provided critical child care services to families of essential workers. We transformed in-person meal programs for seniors into meal delivery initiatives for geometrically larger numbers of seniors and others in need. We partnered with social service agencies to procure and distribute personal protective equipment and basic supplies. We invested millions to retrofit our facilities, making them safe for the resumption of a growing number of programs and services, creating intake mechanisms, modifying traffic flow, adding partitions, and retraining staff to make ready for the return of those who depend on us. By September, nearly every JCC in our movement had resumed in-person programs, the only sector in the organized Jewish community that could make that claim. We discovered that in crisis, we are not alone, and we joined hands with peers and partners, often those we'd previously thought of as competitors, to find ways to support our communities together. In San Diego, the Lawrence Family JCC partnered with shuttered synagogues to bring day camp programs closer to families when busing was unavailable. The Tucson JCC partnered with a nearby congregation to relocate its special needs program, taking this population out of wider circulation and away from needless exposure to others at the JCC. More than 60 JCCs opened their facilities to neighborhood congregations so that synagogue members could gather in safety for high holiday services. Special programs for children of day school, faculty and staff allowed teachers and administrators to return to work in person with the knowledge that their own children were in the very best of hands. We sought wisdom and insight from one another as different corners of our movement confronted the challenges of the pandemic on a rolling basis. Seattle and Riverdale were the first to experience outbreaks, and their leadership thoughtfully and graciously shared insights that made it possible for other JCC communities to make ready for what was to come. We learned to gather on Zoom and in the online universe, and over the ensuing weeks and months, we convened hundreds of meetings and webinars, sharing access to experts in public health, labor and employment, risk management, 
and the new federal legislation that would ultimately bring us almost $300 million in government support. Hundreds of gatherings and more than 20,000 participations had us thinking and working together. Both within and across JCC communities, we began to think in terms that transcended institutional success and increasingly focused on community impact, arm in arm with allies and partners of every stripe and style. Even as we confronted local challenges, the Jewish men and women who proudly served this country in the United States Armed Forces were obliged to remain vigilant and to set aside concerns for themselves and their families. JWB chaplains and lay leaders, many of whom are also with us today at ProCon, representing this critical and unique component of the work of our movement, bore enormous responsibility for all of them. All 10,000 currently on active duty at military bases across the country and around the world. So here we are at our movement's first online professionals conference. Technology has played a crucial role for all of us over the past year, and now having grown not only comfortable with it, but increasingly attuned to its remarkable potential, we will use it to chart the course ahead together. It hasn't been easy. We've suffered losses, too many losses, both at home and at work. We've confronted stresses and strains born of dynamics both directly related to COVID-19 and those wholly unrelated to the pandemic. Social and political upheavals have unsettled the landscape around us, and matters of inclusion and identity and changes in the way society is contending with social and racial justice have required our growing and ongoing attention and our increasingly thoughtful engagement. JCCs are about community. We are about making it possible for everyone who passes through our doors to experience more than a warm welcome and a quality program. Our commitment to inclusion transcends race and religion, politics and practice, ability and personal limitations. The JCCs of North America are dedicated to strengthening Jewish communities and enriching the vibrancy of Jewish life. We are steadfastly committed to being the Jewish community's town square, the center through which everyone in the neighborhoods, towns, and cities we serve can tap into what's most special about what our community has to offer, proudly serving as the Jewish community's embassy to the geographies around us. Together, we comprise the JCC movement. JCC movement, what does that mean? Movements are about collective action in pursuit of common purpose. Movements are defined by a shared vision and by a commitment to change. This movement is about our aspirations for the North American Jewish community. Among them are determination that more and more members of the community will be drawn to greater levels of engagement and participation. That they will come to understand that being part of something larger than themselves of being about something greater strengthens all of us and in turn strengthens each of us. We aspire to greater Jewish community and more vibrant Jewish life, and we will be the engine that transforms that vision into reality. Each of us, every center, every camp, every professional, every chaplain has a critical role to play. There's more to do much more. This conference will be a marketplace of ideas and opportunities linked together by a shared desire to do and be more. We have gathered experts from both within and beyond the JCC movement. Over 200 speakers and presenters will stimulate our thinking and help galvanize our efforts through 19 peer communities, 30 enrichment electives, and so much more. Every element of this conference is open to every one an experience of your own making, so make the most of it. Today would not be possible without the commitment of our sponsors, whose generous support, both financial and professional, made it possible for JCC Association to offer ProCon at no cost to anyone. I am very proud to acknowledge our presenting sponsor, the Coca-Cola Company, and our three JCC Movement Moment sponsors, Climber, Daxco, and Reach Local. Thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. On Thursday afternoon, our closing JCC Movement Moment will take a deeper dive into several continental partnerships in which we are engaged. 
and we will explore how collaborations like these will contribute to making stronger and more robust Jewish communities for generations to come. As ever, leadership is critical to success in every endeavor, and it has been and will continue to be central to who we are and where we are going as a movement and as a community. Today, I'll have the distinct pleasure of taking part in a discussion about leadership with two of the most important voices in the professional Jewish world, Gali Cooks, the founding president and CEO of Leading Edge, which seeks to inspire and influence dramatic change in how Jewish organizations attract, develop, and retain top talent, and Alana Azen, the CEO of JPRO Network, the grassroots organization dedicated to the nearly 100,000 members of the North American professional Jewish community. Moderating our discussion will be eJewish Philanthropy's senior reporter, Helen Chernikoff, a longtime veteran of Jewish media and author of a recent piece on JCC Association's commitment to talent, to you, as a cornerstone priority for our movement. Before we move on, I ask each of you to make the most of your time at ProCon 2021. Today, we celebrate being together. Over the next few days, based on the choices you make, you'll take part in critically important conversations, discussions, and learning opportunities about the future of our field. I urge you to make every moment count. Each one of you does important work for your JCC. Together, you are the most powerful force in professional Jewish life. We are honored and proud to gather together. Hine matov umanayim shevet achim gam yachad. This is just the beginning. Our members, our community. Community that coming to work every day is a chance to build community. Bringing a community together. The resilience of our community. I think certainly this past year, we've seen a lot of that. The continued support of the entire community through what has been a really challenging and difficult year. The stories of our members, our volunteers, our friends who come in and talk about the various ways that this community organization touches their lives, enriches their lives, helps them raise their children. Kids and families and senior citizens that walk through the door looking for friends and connections. The membership and having people be so happy and satisfied to be together enjoying our programs. The picture that I know I get to see every summer of the smiling faces. Camps or JCCs are all about informal education, experiential education. And so anything we can do to help people find the things that they love to do and find the things that they're good at. To say that Camp Informed and continues to inform my life can't be overstated. The mission of the Moe Safra Center is to build community, um, which is something that we do here every day, which in a pandemic is so important, to honor our traditions. Just the commitment to Tikkun Olam and making the world a better place. Being able to be part of a Jewish community within a larger community in general. My grandfather actually started at the YWHA and that eventually turned into the JCC. And his legacy uh, to me is what inspires me. My children and my friends and their children. That ability to make an impact, I think, you know, kind of at the base roots what we're all trying to do is to make the world a little bit better. Jewish ideas and Jewish values make our lives richer. So whatever it is, uh, a word, a custom, a thought, a place, a bit of history, I just am inspired by helping people connect to their Jewish identity. Please welcome to our stage the Jewish media professional who makes sure the stories of our work are shared with our communities, Helen Chernikoff, the senior reporter for eJewish Philanthropy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. That was such a lovely video, um, especially to see everybody so positive and warm after a really interesting 
not to say sometimes difficult year. Um, the JCCs in particular have had to grapple with the culture change generated by the pandemic. We think of JCCs as a place where we come to be healthy. And over the past year, we had to try to stay healthy by not going to our JCCs. Um, there's been so much change and leaders at all levels of the organization have been essential to shepherd all of us together through this and figure out how we're going to move forward. Um, I think it's really important to think about that phrase that, that leaders are at every level. We're not just talking about the C-suite here um, and what we're here to do right now is to talk with three people who are really amazing leaders who can discuss how they nurture that in themselves and in other people. Um, they all represent organizations whose mission is to serve professionals like you. So they know exactly where you're coming from and can help you get to where you wanna go. Um, Ilana Eisen is the CEO of JPro Network and Golly Cooks is the president and CEO of Leading Edge and the JCC Association's president and CEO, Daron Krakow, who you've already hung out with today. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Great to see you, Helen. <laughs> Great to see all of you too. Um, so I think it would be really um, satisfying to take you all back to the beginnings of your career to start this conversation. Um, if you could talk about how your leadership journeys began, and in particular, what was your first Jewish job? Golly, maybe you can get us going. Yeah, thank you. And this is this is such a privilege to be here. And I'm so glad that we were able to see the the beginning part of it in Daron, just Yasha Koch, and thank you for incredibly, uh, incredibly inspiring and also grounding uh, intentions for these uh, this conference. So my first Jewish job, I really had to go back because my first job was a babysitter um, uh, back in uh, Minneapolis, which is uh, where I grew up somewhat. But my first Jewish job was actually a babysitter at a Jewish uh, camp. It was at Camp Herzl in Webster, Wisconsin in 19... And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, really wonderful and, and quite uh, instructive. Uh, and I remember playing a key role, although somewhat uh, adjacent role to the main event, which was, uh, you know, the camping experience. But I remember it being quite formative um, and a very happy summer. Um, that sounds great. Um, Alana, would you like to chime in? Sure. It's great to be here. Um, my my memory is, I think, similar to Gali's. I started my first job teaching supplementary school in 10th grade at Temple Har Zion, which is in the suburbs of Toronto. And um, I actually had that job for nine years, all the way through high school and university. So there's a theme of teaching and working with young people. Daron, you wanna tell uh, yeah. us your story? Very, very happy to join in. And my journey began unexpectedly and uh, unintentionally, I suppose. I was looking for work as a, student at Rutgers uh, and another uh, person in my class uh, announced one day that uh, Temple Shalom in nearby uh, Bridgewater, New Jersey was looking for a USY advisor and it paid uh, the extraordinary salary of $150 a month, which sounded to me like a lot of money. Uh, and because I thought I could use that kind of income, I went for an interview and got the job uh, and started on a path that I had no possible idea of imagining it would take me to the places that it did. Great. Well, I think it's really interesting that um, all three of you have, obviously JCCs work with um, all generations, but there's something clearly really special about working with young people. Um, maybe, it makes sense now to um, talk about how you recognize leadership in other people. Um, and certainly there's, I think, a good chance that when 
when you all were young, that was um, something that was recognized in you that you maybe had um, somebody who saw that potential in you. So maybe you, you could talk a bit about how you go about trying to find that in other people or about what it was like to be, you know, to have so someone see that potential in you. Um, Alana, why, why don't you start? Sure. Um, so I think that um, one of the things that we have to really think about is certainly we look at people who take initiative, who go the extra mile, who um, raise their hands and and at the same time, really think about our own implicit biases and who we might be missing. So how can we flip the power dynamic so it's less about me identifying potential, but that we really are creating an environment in which the person who has potential can raise their hand, can see opportunity, um, and can promote their own leadership. Um, Gali or Daron, do you want to do you want to follow on that? Gali, after do, you. How do we do that? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I I would say that uh, for 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 me, it's somewhat a little bit more. Um, it's just a a bit more simple. I don't do well with negative people. You know, I like the optimists. Um, we seek out the optimists because I think a lot of us are trying to solve problems or do things differently in ways that you may have to hit a wall and then have to come up the, through the side window or through the basement or you know whatever the, the analogy is and I have found that uh, there is a there is a way in which a person's experience the way in which they tackle um, a new opportunity that energy can be really infectious and there actually is research to show that like Debbie Downers actually do infect other Debbie Downers, you know, there is sort of that like wah, wah kind of energy. <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the ways in which we, uh, we really, we want to work, you know, we forget that the, the majority of our waking hours as adults are actually spent at work. So let's spend it with people who make us feel good and sort of one plus one equals three. Um, and that that is a, a more, um, a, you know, sort of like a, there's there's a je ne sais quoi there, but um, there's definitely a, a, a certain energy level um, and the way in which people take initiative and um, go above and beyond, which honestly, I think is like the JCC movement, frankly, like as, you know, you all are like Swiss army knives, like, you know, give, give me a parent, I'll talk to them, give me a toilet, I'll unclog it. So um, I think that's another aspect that is, uh, uh, we certainly want to see more of and, and certainly appreciate when we see it. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, Helen, if you'll permit me, I'm going to jump in and just amplify on a couple of those points. You know, nothing really gets done without capable leadership, not in our field, not in any field. But I think it's easy to confuse leadership with title or leadership with pecking order position. Uh, and I don't necessarily think the title connotes anything other than a set of responsibilities. It doesn't make a person a leader. For me, over the years, uh, I'm looking for a spark. I think that's what Golly was referring to. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for some positive energy that is an attraction. It draws other people to it. Um, and people who are drawn by others are looking to be motivated and inspired to follow. Uh, and that's the way we begin to see progress or effectiveness. We look at targets and goals, and that spark which creates a desire to pursue, to join in that following is key. Uh, and the other thing I would say at the end of the day is leadership in our field, I'm always looking for a mensch. You're looking for somebody with integrity, somebody with principles, uh, so that beyond the spark, you simply admire that leader and you want to get behind them. That to me is what this is all about. So I think a really important question to follow up um, this conversation is how, I mean, of course, we all want to be positive and strong all the time. And of course, we're having this conversation at a time when um, it's been hard for everyone to be that. Golly, you and I have talked about this a lot, and I even because of conversations with you, wrote a, a whole article about how difficult it is to say no, which I think was really an important a piece that I'm very proud of. Um, so, how do you um, how do you nurture people when they're having a tough time? 
and get get these qualities, sort of elicit these qualities and still acknowledge that things are hard, especially when it's true up and down, you know, across across an organization. Anybody, anybody could. I'm, I'm happy to take a first crack and, and very curious about what Alana and Doron you have to say as well. I think Helena, the what we've seen, a uh, part of the answer or or part of the uh, a, a beginning is is really in your question as well. You know, I'm married to a therapist who basically said, you know, naming the feeling is 50% of the healing. Let's acknowledge yeah. the past 14 months. I mean, Doron, you really. You, you laid it out there in your remarks. I mean, the, the JCCs in particular, you were the first ones into this fray of pandemic before we understood what in the world was this. And we were gonna have to sprint and all of a sudden it's 13, 14 months of sprinting. And I think just acknowledging that, the fact that there is you know, burnout, the fact that there is exhaustion, the fact that, that there is, you know, Adam Grant, the organizational psychologist named it in a recent New York Times right. article, languishing or languishing, as somebody would, would said. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a certain level of, wow, for the last 14 months, we've all gone through different levels of grief and trauma and pain and just um, uncertainty. And, and what we found is, for those leaders who name it, those managers who name it, those colleagues who name it, mm. um, it can be incredibly healing just to be, you know, first of all, you're not as alone. You're not the only one who's, who's experiencing this. And then the second is that there's a certain like, oh, I see you, I see you. Okay, now mm. let's have a conversation about like, how can I help? Like, what do you need? And that's where we've seen, you know, managers who've had, you know, weekly check-ins, which is something that's actually been a magical, um, improvement, honestly, throughout this time where we've had to disperse and then come back and then disperse a lot more internal communications and contact with your direct mm -hmm. manager and senior leadership team. And that is, that's wonderful. Those are like the connective tissues of a, of a team and an organization. So if you have that, you know, active sort of personal check-in regularly, what we've seen is from there, there have been parenting clusters that have come out of it, you know, different pods different meal trains that have started out because they've understood that, you know, in this relay race that we're in, oh, this person needs a little bit more help. Can we get them, you know, a series of Shabbat dinners or whatever that is. And there's, it, it really, those are the types of things that first let's acknowledge and then think about what are the ways in which we can help like 5%. I think, I think that's also the, the a good sort of bar because there's no way that there's like, a, there's no panacea here. We are all in a very different sort of, experiments and experience in this 14 months journey, but to be able to have those muscles of being able to say, Alana, what's going on? Like, can I help? And and not necessarily what's on your to-do list, great, okay, next, which has to happen too, there's an accountability, but I think that acknowledgement and then thinking about what's, how can I make it 5% better? Is there a way, mm -hmm. um, is something that has been really powerful. Wouldn't it be nice if we could plan for how leadership is going to be exercised, if we always knew that we were going to have the runway that we intend mm -hmm. and therefore evolution and growth is simply a byproduct of thoughtful planning and collaboration, what we've seen and experienced over a crisis that is already more than 14 months old and is not nearly uh, complete yet uh, is that we were pressed into service in all kinds of leadership roles in ways we could never have imagined. And for just about everybody, in ways in which we had no basis to draw upon prior experience. I looked across the field over those early weeks of the pandemic and was simply blown away by the fact that without a playbook, whether it was a camp director or an early childhood teacher or early childhood director or the JCC directors themselves or others, they simply had to, they had to bootstrap it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's when leadership mm -hmm. is pulled, put, I think, to the greatest test. And you see what real leadership is when in, in the absence of a playbook, you find a way to step up and step forward under the enormous pressures that we felt, the personal pressures, the family pressures, the economic pressures, the business pressures, you know, having to carry out the worst of the responsibilities of a senior professional, which is to sever the employment, to uh, eliminate the uh, livelihood of treasured, valued members of our own teams, and yet continue to provide positive and informed leadership for your constituents and for the people around you. And make no mistake, leaders are watched 
leaders are attended to by people within and beyond the immediate infrastructure that they're responsible for. Uh, it's leadership without a playbook that's really put to the test, and it's the support of peers and allies and partners, the wisdom and contributions of Leading Edge and JPRO, of Jewish federations and social service agencies that allowed us to rely on one another as we were tested and to make us feel that even in those darkest days, we were not alone in having to contend with the things that had befallen us. Um, Alana, can you talk about how your experience of this, this period, which it's funny to hear everybody say it's 14 months. I'm still sort of saying, oh, we're at the year anniversary, but I guess we're past that. Um, so can you talk about some, you know, some, some concrete um, tools that you have picked up over the course of this, uh, this period that have you found useful that maybe you didn't know about before you started to use them? Um, I appreciate that. I've, I've, I've thought jokingly that we should have a, a, a photo contest for um, all of our strange office setups, like the part, you know, that, <laughs> that we're not seeing. I've, I've learned how to put a laptop on a, a stepladder as a, as a you know, big desk while it happens over there. So um, look, I would say that just, you know, building on what you just said, Daron, about the way that we've had to sort of snap into action, um, push through, like we've all gained those skills. And I think the piece that we need to be super disciplined about is to get out of the important and urgent quadrant and into the important. This has been a crucible moment that has highlighted our greatest strengths and has also shown us our deficits. And so when it comes to talent and talent management, um, where have we adapted that is temporary versus where have we adapted that we need to retain or build on? I think we've learned a lot, for example, about the, the systemic strengths and weaknesses that we have around supervision. You know, it's been magnified by the remote. It's been magnified by the crisis. Um, how do we not just turn to the next thing, but really pause and say, what will be different about our practice going forward? Yeah, that sounds so great. And it also sounds like real, a really hard thing to do when everything is, is still so chaotic um, and changing. I, but it does seem like some of these practices um, to what you were saying, Golly, about check-ins um, mm -hmm. have really flourished in such interesting ways. I spoke with the, um, the CEO of Mazon, the Hunger Group. She, t her team, texts her every Sunday night or every Monday morning, and and um, they all just love that. And she says that she probably will, you know, keep doing that. But to what you were saying, Alana, you know. There's no one size fits all um, way to do this, and maybe there are some people who who won't who 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 wouldn't do so well with something like that. So mm -hmm. I just want to say that um, I really admire <laughs> everything you all do, and not only doing it but trying to be reflective about how you're doing it. Um, maybe we can. Following up on that, we could talk about sort of your personal touchstones. Um, maybe this is a mantra or an image or a song, you know, something that that you think about when you're in need of some inspiration. Um, maybe Daron, you wanna wanna go? Yeah, with pleasure. With uh, you know, it's uh, there's a lot to think about there. Uh, and I think when you're being as hyper-stimulated as we are in the context of a crisis and all of the things that we're contending with, those touchstones become all the more important. Uh, you know, for me, uh, it's all about keeping uh, a focus, keeping an eye on the ultimate goal and intention. Our goal as a community of JCCs, as a movement, is bringing and building strength in Jewish community and Jewish life. And therefore, whatever it is that we're uh, confronted with, that we have to contend with, making sure that we don't lose sight of that focus allows us to adapt within a comfortable frame, 
You were talking about all of the changes that we have been compelled to uh, uh, undertake and the things that we may want to keep with us when this crisis is over. I look out at our field. I look out at this agency at JCC Association, and I see people doing things uh, sharing skills and talents in ways that they never had before when they were doing their primary work or focusing on their primary function. And I think that's been the story at every JCC across the continent. It's been all hands on deck. And people have come out and said, I can be helpful in this area that has not been my primary responsibility. You know what? I've always wanted to be useful in this way. Or frankly, where do you need me? I know I've got a primary gig here, but we're in crisis. So point me in the direction of the work that needs to be done, and I'm going to help to figure it out. I think that in the broader context of we're in this business in order to do something greater for the community is the thing that I'm desperate for us to hold on to moving beyond the end of this crisis. If the touchstone is the goal and focus on the goal, then we have discovered within ourselves the potential to do things we never imagined were possible because we were confronted by a need to get out of our comfortable space. And now our ability as leaders within and across the field to embrace those new gifts, uh, those new skills and these new experiences and to put wind behind them, to give them fuel so that we can capitalize on them on an ongoing basis, even as we get back to what we hope will be something that approaches some kind of a new routine, that's the great opportunity that lies in front of us. And again, the touchstone is the goal. It's that vision. Mm. We are here to create greater Jewish community, to be an engine for it. Look at all of the new tools that we have to bring to bear. Mm -hmm. Alana? Um, I, I'm, I'm really privileged to, to work with a coach, an executive coach, and she's taught me something that I, I find myself quoting at least once a week, which is the insight that a weakness is a strength overdone. Um, that for me has been transformative, the recognition that our weaknesses and our strengths are intertwined and that the work of leadership is about discerning do I lean into this thing? Is is more of it needed? Or do I need to sort of pull back and lean into an area where, where I'm less comfortable? So um, one example that that um, if my team is watching, they will <laughs> they will giggle is that they they refer to me as an idea machine. And they don't always mean it as a compliment, right? <laughs> there are pros and cons. <laughs> when the CEO is generating the ideas, it gives less room for everyone else to be generating ideas because they're always catching. Or, you know, sometimes we need to be more focused. Sometimes we need to be more experimental. So when do I register the idea and put it aside versus when do we lean mm. into it? And, you know, for any strength we have, I think it's important to interrogate this sort of other side of the coin. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah, what about you, Gali? Touchstone. I just want to say, Alana is an idea machine. So I'm going to double click on that one. That's, <laughs> that's very true. Um, yeah, I think my mind goes from a from a personal direction. One of the things that over the last 14 months, it's it's always been somewhat simmering in my own leadership, but has really come to the foreground in ways that I, I mean, it has become a mantra: give people the benefit of the doubt. Mm. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we are working with mentions. I really do believe that, Jerome, and I think you're right that that's that you wouldn't be working in the Jewish nonprofit sector and on the side of like the social sector if that wasn't part of like your core. And all of us have been experiencing the last 14 months in different ways. And we don't know what's happening, you know, beyond the Zoom screen, Alana, to your point. Right. And that's, that's where, you know, whether it's in my team or whether it's in the ne different networks of folks that we've been working with, whenever there's sort of this like, that was kind of off or what, Let's give people the benefit of the doubt. We have no idea what's happening in the foreground, and you know that that's something that definitely is has been um, uh, something that I've tried to to metabolize and also practice. And I will say it is a practice. Um, the other thing that I go back to, I mean, Daron, you really you really made me think of this. So we have we have uh, one of our board members um, is, and I pinch myself that he's a, one of our board members is Marty Linsky. Um, who is one of the you know founding parents of um, of adaptive leadership modality? And one of the things that he says is you know the role of a leader is to impart direction, protection, and order for an organization. 
And that during a year like we've had, which is biblical, that's hard because there has not been a playbook. And, and yet I find myself in a master juggler kind of way thinking about where, you know, in the beginning of this, I think a lot of us went into, you know, almost like command and control, like, okay, we're in emergency. Let's just like, you know, make sure to figure out where, what's going on. And then as this has continued, there's, there's been more of an evolution of that. And it's always been in my, the back of my mind of, oh, you know what, the protection, like, let's just shut that piece down. Or, you know, what, we really have to be clear here or be clear about the fact that we're not clear. You know, they're knowns and they're unknowns. Let's just be clear about them because we can control certain things and we can't control other things. Um, so those are two things that I sort of hold, um, one much more, you know, interpersonally and, and then, you know, more organizationally also because organizations are made up of people. But um, yeah, as, as I try to exercise leadership. It's so interesting to hear about all of these, these ideas that seem very um, they seem to make intuitive sense, but I do think that there's been something about the pandemic that has brought them home in a useful way. Like, like I'm sure before the pandemic, you occasionally thought I need to give people the benefit of the doubt or more than occasionally, but because the, it was so vividly illustrated by the remote situation, now you've had a chance to really learn that lesson in a deep way that I bet, you know, will, will stay with you. Um, Actually, maybe maybe we could talk a bit about that whole strengths and weaknesses connection, um, and and the the uh, concept of of getting feedback constructively, hopefully from members of your team. And has has the pandemic? How has the pandemic played into that challenge of leadership? Alana, would you? Since you, yeah. I smiled. I, I, I am obsessed with this topic. Um, I think in part because it's such a difficult practice. Um, and and golly, when you were speaking about giving the benefit of the doubt, I think it, that is so much wrapped up in a in a feedback practice. I remember, um, golly, one of the very first times I heard you speak when I was early in my tenure at JPro, you spoke about how we as a field are really good at, at saying kol hakavod. We're really good at giving each other pats on the back. And we have a much harder time being candid where something is difficult or you know isn't going the way it needs to. Um, I think the ability to give and receive feedback is like a non-negotiable. We've all got to work on it. Um, and where there is a hierarchy or there are power dynamics, it is so incumbent upon those in the position of um, formal authority to request feedback, to proactively request it, to make specific requests, um, and to make sure that we receive feedback in a way that is not defensive or doesn't seem punitive so that, you know, that can really flow into the system. And that is so hard for any human being to do. Helen, I'm going to jump in for a second, and I know that uh, uh, there's never enough time for these conversations. A couple of things I just wanted to uh, to note at this stage of the program. First of all, Golly, I'm thrilled that you mentioned Marty Linsky, uh, who is extraordinary, who has extended himself to me and to us on a number of occasions, and who will be a speaker at this conference. Uh, we're looking right. forward to That's hearing right. from him. Uh, you know, the three of us, and Helen, it's probably true at uh, EJP as well, are working for agencies that have been largely remote throughout this entire pandemic. And that has created a dynamic for us that actually contrasts with the dynamic that's going on in JCCs and with the several thousand people that are joining us across the field. They've been in the building, most of them, if not uh, the overwhelming majority since at least September and many almost without interruption since the start of the pandemic. Uh, so. I think they confronted the same challenges, the need to rely and trust and defer that we have had to deal with in the context of not seeing our uh, colleagues in person in the ways that we're used to. Uh, but because more have been demanded of them, the ability to be as attentive as they would like to be has been constrained to some degree. Uh, we've been tested as a field and our professionals across the field have raised their game uh, they have allowed us to confront this and to meet the test because they have not been relying on us to be as attentive as we might otherwise like to be. 
And that's given us some freedom. It's given us some liberty as well to lead with the knowledge that we have people upon whom we can depend whether or not we're taking on predictable or wholly unpredictable dynamics and experiences. Uh, that'll be can another I, great takeaway for us. Yes, um, and can I just, we're, we're almost at the, our limit of time, but I just wanna say that um, what you say about the professionals in the field is so inspiring. I know that this is true, that um, JCT professionals have been in the field earlier than anyone else in touch with so many people and playing such an important role. And so I know it, it's our thing, but kola kavod to all of them and all of you who are true. watching. And um, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been delightful. Thank it's been you. our honor. Thank you all. And Alana, Galley, we are so privileged to have you as our partners and our allies and our wellspring of wisdom and ideas. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Too kind. It's the grandparents commenting on how amazing it is to see all of our ECC children walking all over this building. The humming sound that our building has when it's cooking, when it's busy here. This is nuts because it used to drive me crazy and now I miss it. It's the feedback from the phone um, intercom system. My favorite sound from our center that I missed in this past year has to be the sound of the kids. My favorite sound around here is, is the kids singing. Mr. Mike and Shabbat sing every Friday at 1030 in the auditoriums. My favorite sound is the sound of our entire community joined together in song on a Friday morning. We're welcoming Shabbat. Is the sound of the children's voices um, outside playing this spring. It reminds me of normal times and gives me hope for the future. When the song leaders play their guitar and there's energy and there's music and the campers are answering back or participating with the song leader. I would say the fire. This is the sound, you know, when everybody is silent and everybody's listening together. The crackling of the campfire, the slamming of the doors, and the ruach and enthusiasm of our song sessions. People talking. <laughs> when there isn't, there isn't much talk around here. It's very silent. The sound of laughter at every age that fills our hallways every day has been too silent for too long. It's just so quiet right now. There's no clock of the tiles. There's nobody calling bingo. I can't say that there's one sound I miss because I miss them all. My office is on the second floor and you look down into the galleria that is usually a buzz of people, meaning it's the main hallway. It's our main, we call it main street where people are coming and going and from preschool into you know, after school, into our fitness areas, into classes, into our theater, into all different kinds of programs. And I stood over the balcony and it was empty and it was silent. And I started to cry because I couldn't remember what it felt like to hear that sound and to see those people anymore. And so I'm so looking forward to when that Main Street feels a buzz of being the town square that it is once again. Before we close this JCC Movement Moment, on behalf of everyone joining us here today, thank you, Elena, thank you, Gali, for helping us to broaden our understanding of leadership and its impact on our movement. Your work and your agencies are invaluable partners. You are allies to both JCC Association and the entire movement as we seek to strengthen Jewish community and enhance the vibrancy of Jewish life from coast to coast. And Helen, our thanks are also due you for your elegant and thoughtful facilitation. EJP has become an important daily source of information and insight for every JCC professional. And we take great pride in seeing ourselves and our work in the stories you help to tell every day. But it is you, our JCC professionals, who are truly the essential workforce of our JCCs. At every age and every program and experience, you are the ones that make it happen. 
I know that each of you takes pride in bringing your skills, your talents, and your ideas to every aspect of your work. You are much more than a dynamic workforce. You are the very heartbeat of our movement. Even though we couldn't be in person today, I have enjoyed watching the videos featuring your voices and faces. It's clear that despite the challenges of the past year, each and every one of you is dedicated to raising your game further in the weeks and months that lie ahead. Coming up next are our peer community sessions. 90 minutes to dive into the work of your cohort, and there is so much more throughout the next few days. So take a moment, stretch your legs, grab a drink, make a pit stop, and we'll look for you across the rest of your ProCon 2021 experience.